How majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Let us bow our heads. Father in heaven, we are so thankful and we rejoice in the blessing of such a beautiful day. We realize, Lord, that this is a gift from you and we are thankful. As we worship now, we invite your Holy Spirit to be with us so that we will be blessed. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Welcome to the College Church. We're so glad that everyone is here with us this morning. This is a momentous day. It is the last day that our pastor, Dr. P pastor Pate, will be with us. And we are going to sorely miss him. And we hope that you would be blessed for being here with us today. Again, welcome. Morning. My name is Daniel Lacorda, and I'll be doing the call to worship today. I'll be reading the fine print, and I ask the congregation to follow along and read the bold print. If you were called to draw near the great throne, how would you respond? And come with joy and confidence, for Christ has opened the door. to you. Happy Sabbath. It's a good high Sabbath. And uh, Kevin's a little concerned because the water's colder than he expected. <laughs> I'm sorry, my friend. Sorry, my friend. Anyway, such a good Sabbath. And we have three that are joining us this morning. The church board has recommended the membership of all of them to you, uh, pending the baptism today and Kevin being the first uh, this morning. His name didn't make it into the bulletin. We apologize. That was just, uh, it was finalized after the bulletin was printed. But uh, it is such a pleasure and such a joy to be here this morning and to be part of this. And I'm going to let Pastor Heather talk because she's going to baptize our friend Kevin. Um, I've had the privilege of studying with Kevin. And something about him that just really struck me is that he's just so loving. He's so open-hearted and loving. And I asked him why he wanted to be baptized, and he said, because he loves Jesus, and that's good enough for me. And um, 
So I'm very excited to be baptizing him today. It was really a wonderful experience for me to kind of see the simplistic, open-hearted, loving faith that a child has. And um, I wish that we could all have more of that. So, Kevin, today, because you love Jesus, because you want everyone to know and you want to make this commitment, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hold on to my arm. Okay. 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 Good morning again. I'm sorry, the water's a little cooler than we expected. <laughs> Happy Sabbath to you. Sabbath. Folks, these are some people that you don't know well, but you're going to get to know and you're going to get to love. Julio and Michelle. Uh, a number of weeks ago, they visited our congregation. They've been looking for a church home and uh, came and spoke to me afterward and said that they've been looking forward to moving toward baptism and uh, they, they found the college church is what speaks to them, what's, what, where they want to grow. Uh, these folks live in Lowell, so it's a commitment for them to get here on Sabbath. Uh, I've had the privilege of being in their home and met with them. And, and I just want to briefly give you the story. Julio, a number of years ago, was baptized as a Seventh-day Adventist in a Ken Cox evangelistic series. That's right. But uh, had a period of fading away and uh, drifting away. And then Michelle, now Michelle grew up, your mother was Islamic and your father was Buddhist. And um, so she had no Christian background at all, but through the, the wonderful Christianity of a, a, a Bible church, uh, came to know Jesus and loved Jesus and became a Christian about three years ago um, and, and gave her heart to Jesus about three years ago. And she and Julio now have been married about two years, two years, and uh, they have continued to grow together, to read, to study, and they've decided that this is a commitment they want to make together, to be baptized together in Christ and also officially be part of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and part of this church. And I've had the privilege of, of meeting with them. I'm amazed at how, at their commitment and, and their desire to continue to grow uh, you, you read your Sabbath school lesson in French and English every day, and you do in Cambodian and English every day. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> anyway, it's just been a joy to get to know these folks, and I know that you're going to embrace them and love them, and the fact that you are able here today to share this special moment with them, I know it means a lot to them. Amen. Okay, thank you. Julio, let me... Okay. There we go. Julio, I know that uh, some years ago you made a commitment in Christ, and, and uh, for, for a while it wasn't quite there. But you've re, re-energized that commitment, yeah. and you've wanted to continue to grow in Jesus and know him and be everything that he wants you to be. And so because of that, it's my privilege today 
to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Michelle, it's been a long journey for you, uh, leaving a, a system where you didn't know Jesus at all, and now you love Jesus and you want to follow him and join Julio in this step. And, and so it's my special privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Look at you, Chris, Thank you. Thank you, thank you. There you go. Thank you. Wonderful people and what a wonderful day. It's such a blessing and I know that you folks will embrace them and take them in and love them and support them and encourage them. And obviously, if you are here today and Baptism has been something you've kind of thought about. I know that this church family would be happy to work with you, that Pastor Heather would be happy to work with you to move to having an experience and an opportunity like this. Thank you so much. I'm looking to be joined by Dave Cady for a, an announcement that I think is important, especially when it comes to our Christian education. Thank you, Ralph. It's such a blessing to have been able to witness those baptisms this morning. I'm sure you all agree. Part of the blessing that College Church is also involved in is our school down the street, South Lancaster Academy Browning Elementary. We commit a significant part of our church budget to supporting those two institutions every year, and, and it's a blessing um, that all of you or many of you have experienced throughout your lives or your children's lives. Um, sure that many, many hands would go up if I asked today who has been touched by the ministry down, that, down the street at those two schools. Um, I know in my family alone, both my mother and father uh, attended there. My father graduated from there. Um, I was an outsider. I went to Union Springs up in New York. So, But my dad graduated and we had the privilege of sending our children through that institution. As many of you are aware, if you've seen this announcement in the bulletin today, I'd like you to please take this home with you today. Put it up where you can remind yourself about what's coming up next week. On the fridge, on your tack board, wherever it's important for you to remember to come out on Thursday night. I recently ran across a, a quote from Niels Eric Andreessen, who's the current president at Andrews University. He said this back in 2006, and as I saw this quote, it struck a chord with me, and I'd like to share it with you today. Andreasen says, if you're a practicing, believing Seventh-day Adventist, you are a believer in education. If you push our faith, our church, our Christian life, all together into one hard matter, like a nucleus, what, what is in there? There's faith and there's learning. It's not just something that we do in a classroom. It's what we believe in. And I believe that today as a Seventh-day Adventist. I believe in faith and I believe in learning through Adventist education. So today, I'm here to draw your attention to our important constituency meeting coming up Thursday night, 7 p.m. down at South Lancaster Academy. At this meeting, we as a church body, being one of the the major constituent churches in this school organization are going to be asked to vote on a proposal that will involve active and intensive participation of our church family. This proposal is unlike anything that I've ever encountered and many of us who are on the committee planning for this, the capital campaign, we were uh, freshly surprised by this approach and something that we felt very important to bring to our church body. So, I'll tell you a little bit about the approach. It's spiritually based. It's a proposal that is expected to result in increased tithe, increased giving, and most importantly, increased membership participation within our church family. In addition to that, it's going to provide support for our school as well. 
As part of this program, our church and the other constituent churches of South Lancaster and Browning will also experience revival and growth. If you're interested in that, and if you're interested in a strong Christian school for your children and their children who will come after that, please come Thursday night, hear about it, ask questions about it, and most importantly, express your, your support for it through your vote. Thank you very much. The support for Christian education is important not only to us as a church family, but to the Southern New England Conference. Our offering this morning will go towards the Southern New England Conference church uh, budget. And I invite you to remember that as you give your tithe and your offerings this morning.
Accept our gifts, we pray. We ask that you would bless them. Not only the gifts, but the givers. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. The wrong uh, headphone. Oh, I know, I'm on now. I just... He was, I left Wayne hanging there. He was looking for a different microphone. He's, he's going, you know, by the way, I, you know, I, I hope that you do randomly stop to appreciate the people who are behind the scenes and do things like run the, run the sound system. Um, if you've never worked on a PA booth or something like this, they say it's a lot like a fire department. It's long stretches of boredom and suddenly moments of panic. You know, then boredom, then panic, and uh, it's kind of like being a, a fireman. So uh, we, we need to appreciate, and certainly there are times when you've got a little bit of a, a lag or a lapse, and sometimes it's people like me who grabbed the wrong microphone and left him hanging. Sorry about that. Uh, Lord bless you all. It's so good to see you this morning. What a fun morning. This is great. Pastor Heather, please join me. You see in the bulletin that we're going to have a dedication now, too, for Mr. Jacob with a K. Jacob with a K. Come on up, come on up. This is great. And Bella's going to do something special too, isn't she? That's right. This is Mr. Jacob. Jacob Taylor Wood. Hey, you doing, dude? You're looking great this morning. He says, I'm here to survey my kingdom. Yeah, you're looking good. How about this? This is pretty good, isn't it? Yeah, anyway, by the way, uh, just to point out to you, I have a beautiful new tie on today. Thank you very much. It's a gift from Patrick. Uh, <laughs> no, that's a great tie. Thank you so much. Such a privilege and happy moments, happy moments this morning in baptism and with the dedication of Mr. Jacob here and uh, where the church family together makes a commitment along with Patrick and Diana, uh, a commitment to do whatever we can, whatever it takes, like David speaking about SLA and, and the future of our schools, and do whatever it can, we can to create the atmosphere and provide the very best opportunity for little ones like Mr. Jacob to choose Jesus, to adore Jesus, admire Jesus, and grow in Jesus. And so Mr. Jacob isn't going to remember anything about this. Someday somebody will talk to him when we give you the dedication certificate. He can see it, but uh, someday somebody's going to talk to him about the day he was dedicated, and he'll say, I don't remember anything about that. Well, it's not about you, dude. It's about mommy and daddy and the rest of the church family. And so it's our privilege. The Bible says that Jesus took the children in his arms, and they liked being with him. They liked Jesus a lot. We're going to pause now because Miss Isabella is going to make a contribution for her brother. Are you going to do something, sweetie? Here she goes.
Well, Mr. Jacob, these people are praying for you today. Wish Jesus was right here in a way that you could understand and you could know that he would be holding you. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the privilege of, of observing and watching and caring for the little ones. Lord, for the privilege and the responsibility. And today, Patrick and Diana have brought themselves before you with their family, with their friends, and with their church family, have brought Mr. Jacob here to this moment. And we would dedicate him to be a man of God and, and dedicate the church family to be better, to be more of what Jesus would be so that he has the very, very, very best opportunity to grow, to love, and to know you. These things we pray in Christ's name. Amen. You want to hold him for a second? Sure. He was okay. happy with you. He was happy with me, I know. I hope he starts crying. No, <laughs> not really. <laughs> Patrick, Lord bless you folks. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Bella. You were wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Megan. All right. It's now time to show the story. But before I get the story, I would like to just uh, draw your attention. In your bulletin, you'll see this uh, little pink slip. And we are formulating right now, we have a committee, a pre-search committee, that is formulating a search committee to start the process of looking for a new head pastor. And we would like a representation on that committee of a large demographic of our church, people who you think are qualified and uh, represent different demographics. So if you could write down a few names that you would like to see possibly on the committee, it would help make um, the pre-search committee's job a lot easier in trying to find a varied group of people. And you can also drop them off at the end of the service in the offering plates that we will have a couple deacons holding at the back doors. Thank you. The children can come forward. Sorry about that. <laughs> How are you boys and girls doing today? Good. You know, I was going to bring you something to look at today, and it's my new puppy. And I have a new puppy, and his name is Glacier, but I think you would have been a little bit too excited to have here, so um, if you come to the picnic, you can see him. I have a new puppy, and his name is Glacier, and he's a Great Dane. And his daddy was 175 pounds, and his mommy was 156 pounds, so he's going to be a big boy. And um, I love puppies, don't you? How many of you have puppies or dogs? Yeah? How many of you want puppies and dogs? Okay. See, parents, everybody wants a puppy, so it's time to get everybody a puppy. Um, well, there was a little boy 
who really, really wanted a puppy. And so his parents finally said, okay, you can have a puppy. And he was so excited, and it came the day to go and pick out a puppy. So he went to a farm where a man was selling puppies. He was selling golden retriever puppies, and I know that there's some people here who have golden retrievers, and they're a great dog, and they're so beautiful, and they're so friendly. And he was going to pick out a golden retriever puppy. And the farmer brought out the puppies, and they were all excited and jumping and roly-poly and cute. There's nothing cuter than a puppy. And they were, they were just so exciting, and he was so excited. And he just sat there, and he was looking at them. And he looked at all of the puppies, and he noticed that one puppy had a bad leg. And he was just born with a bad leg, and he had a limp, and he kind of drug it behind him, and he was a little smaller than the other puppies, and he wasn't quite as playful as the other puppies because he had a bad leg. And the farmer said, hey, son, have you decided what puppy you want to buy? He said, they're $50 each, and, and you can have any of the puppies for $50, except he says, um, that puppy I'm not going to I'm not going to sell. I'm just going to give that puppy away. And he had a bum leg. And the little boy said, "Well, that's the puppy I actually wanted." But he says, "I don't want you to give it to me. I want to buy him. I want to pay $50." He said, "He's not really worth $50. He can't run and play and catch sticks and do things that the other puppies can do. He's not really worth $50. You can just have him, Sonny." He says, "No. I want to buy him for $50. So he said, well, OK, I'll take your $50, and you can have your puppy. And as he was getting up to leave, he said, why did you want that particular puppy? And the little boy pulled up his jean leg. And you know what? He had a brace from here to his ankle. He had a bad leg. He said, well, you see, He's worth it to me, and I thought he would need somebody who understands him. So he bought the puppy with the bad leg. You know, that's very much what Jesus did. He thought we were worth it. And so he decided that he, we would need somebody who understands, he, who, who he understands. So he became like us. Even though he was God in heaven, he came down to be a person with all of those limitations and with all of those frailties and with all of the pain, he came down to be just like us because he said they're going to need somebody who understands him. And he thought that we were worth it and he paid the ultimate price. So I want you guys to remember that. No matter how you are or who you are or what you've done, God thinks you're worth it and he understands you because he became just like you. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Father, that you did become like us and help us to find worth and value in that. We love you in your name. Amen. Before we have our prayer, I want to um, make a special appeal to you to join us on Wednesday evening for our prayer meetings. This week we have a special presentation by Dr. Dick Brown talking about the genetics in the Bible. So we invite you to join him on Wednesday evening. I believe it's at 7.30? At 7. There's another um, thing I would like to, to present to you before we begin our prayer. Juliet Willoughby brought something to my attention um, that we received, I believe it was yesterday, that should have us all very, very concerned. And I'm going to ask her to read that communication to you.
I am not on the, in the bulletin because I was trying to verify sources first and actually got a call from, uh, text from Joyce Malin in verifying, uh, actually she posted it on Facebook. And uh, you know, you need to be sure. So I was just kind of doing my due diligence and she said that she did speak with somebody from 3ABN and I'm going to read this to you now. Urgent prayer request for all of us. Dear friend, just a few minutes ago, I received the following text message on my phone from Sean Malone, who leads Crisis Relief International, CRI. We spoke briefly on the phone and I assured him that we would share this urgent prayer need with all our contacts. We lost the city of Kirkush, it fell to ISIS, and they are beheading children systematically. This is the city to which we have been smuggling food. ISIS has pushed back Kurdish forces as in within 10 minutes of our CRI team, of where our CRI team is working. Thousands more fled into the city of Erbil last night. The UN evacuated the staff in Erbil. Our team is unmoved and will stay. Prayer cover needed. Please pray sincerely for the deliverance of the people of northern Iraq from the terrible advancement of ISIS and its extreme economic goals for mass conversion or death for Christians in this area. And then it goes on to be asking for this to be passed on to individuals. Nora Nelson, Hal, Pastor Hal Stenson, Three Angels Broadcasting. Thank you. Thank you. And now, um, Ilsa Grunder, our head elder, wishes also to share something. Good morning, church. I'd now like to invite Sandy and Pastor Pate to join us on the pulpit. It is my privilege to express our warm sentiments. I don't want to look at you. <laughs> Towards Pastor Peyton Sandy, to the words of Don Knoll. Today we praise God for our pastor who served us throughout all these years. He laughed with us during our humor and comforted us during our tears. He was sent by our Lord and our shepherd to lead us to green pastures so green. He has led us to trust in the gospel and to witness all we have seen. O oh Lord, to you be the glory for health and strength through his days. O oh bless and keep all his loved ones till they add to eternity's praise. May the beauty of God be upon him, and there may be showered with grace from above. May he shine as a jewel of heaven, as souls come to trust in God's love. God bless our pastor and bless Sandy. God bless all their work here below. Bless them and give them forever the best of store, heaven's store can bestow. God had sent you to this place to lead us in the way that he would have us work and think and live from day to day. We're grateful that you are here with us to teach us from his word. We thank you for your ministry, your guidance, and your care. Thank you. We have um, Renette Wetchie, who has done flowers for the church for many years, has put together a bouquet. Uh, we have two prayer shawls, one for Sandy and one for the pastor. And um, I got the idea of making something New England. I didn't want them to forget that they were from New England, or that they'd been in New England. So when you think of New England landscapes, what do you think of? Leaves. <laughs> 
fall leaves, fall foliage. What else? What else? Lighthouses, covered bridges. Those were my thoughts, but I ended up wanting to put something on, something that they would remember. Country church, white steeple, fall foliage, um, stone, stone wall, and uh, something that they would remember New England by. So. They can open it. Oh yeah. I'm going to steal the moment as well. Okay. So um, Joyce couldn't be here today, uh, but one of her colleagues um, did an etching of the college church um, up on a mirror above a mirror, so um, that was something special that she wanted them to have. Thank you. Are you all set? Is that you it? all set? I think so. You are. I am going to take the moment to uh, also express the gratitude that the early teen and junior class has for Pastor Pate. For those of you who don't know and who don't sit in and teach or sit in into those Sabbath school lessons, he has over the past year and a half created a brand new program for that age group. Extremely exciting. You should see the kids, how they attend, participate, and are loving to learn about Jesus through that ministry of his. And even better and lucky for us, he's committed to, even though he's gone, he's going to continue to feed that program on an ongoing basis. We're very grateful for what he's done for us. A little token from that group. Thank you so much, so very kind. Um, words can't express. It was, it's been a privilege for us to be here. As, as we've told a number of people, this was the hardest professional decision we've ever made. Uh, and it had most, mostly 99% of it was the people, the people. Thank you all, thanks so much. Uh, Lord bless you all. We've got a service to get to here. <laughs> and now it is our time to approach our Heavenly Father. So would you please stand with me as we sing our prayer song. have special requests and special praise to join us up front as we kneel before our Maker. You may come forward now. Gracious, loving, Heavenly Father, we, your children, bow before you, united in our sinfulness. We recognize, Lord, that you are our Creator. And before you, we stand naked. And we ask, Lord, that as we do so, 
that you would cover us with your righteousness. Forgive us, Father, we pray for the things that we have said and thought and done that was contrary to your will for us and your law. Father, we come to you with special requests, with praises. We're thankful that some of our members who have been sick have returned to worship with us today. We're thankful for our children being here. We're thankful for the Pates and the service that they have given to you and to us during their time with us. And we ask, Lord, that you would bless them as they leave. We ask your blessings on Pastor Pate as he gives his sermon to us this morning. There are those in our congregation, in our community, Lord, who are hurting in some way, who have some who have special needs. And Lord, we're just going to mention a few of them. We have Mark and Eric, David. And Father, we specifically and specially ask for your intervention in Jackson, Brooklyn's life. He was here just a few weeks ago, a little baby, his whole life ahead of him. But Lord, he's in special need of your watch care right now. We're thankful, Lord, that Elnora is back. We're thankful that Callie is with us, Lord, from Maine. We ask, Lord, that you would be with Bob and Fred, Diane, Lewis, Victor, Karen. We are blessed that Yeshenia is with us this morning. We ask that you would continue to be with her. Be with Audrey, Stella, Amanda, Kevin, Tom and Karen, our special brother Rick, Delace, Martha, Regina and Roger. We're glad to see Zhao here with us this morning. And we ask, Lord, that you be with Linda, Adam, and Nick. We all have needs, Lord. We all need you to come into our lives and inspire us to continue to work for you. But most of all, Lord, we pray that you would prepare our hearts to be able to receive you on that great waking up morning when you will break through the clouds and save us, we pray in your precious Son's name. Amen.
is found in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8. Most importantly, love each other deeply. Love has a way of not looking at others' sins. Thank you so much. We have a happy item of business to transact first. I'd like to invite Julio and Michelle and Kevin to join me here, please. Kevin, come on up. We have a recommendation for a membership transfer. You saw the second reading already. Uh, this is for Barbara Linton to the Village Church. Is there such a motion? And second, please. And any question or challenge, all in favor, raise a hand, please. Thank you. And then we have the happy privilege of the recommendation of the church board to receive these folks into church membership because of their baptism today. And uh, I know that everyone, it's just been a, a joy to be here and to witness and be part of this. Is there a motion to receive Julio and Michelle and Kevin into official membership of our church? And second, and all in favor, say amen. Amen. All right. Thank you. Kevin, here's a baptism again. Julio and Michelle. There we go, folks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm sure that you'll take advantage at the end of the service to greet them and give them your best regards and your love. I have. I'm not going to speak long today. Uh, it's been a wonderful full Sabbath already. Uh, I actually have, this is really curious, this is a cute trinket that I've had for a long time. Is It is, as you can see, it's a, a meter, 
a parking meter, it's, it, and it's a real one. Uh, this beast, I was walking in Oakland, California, and it used to work, and I actually tried it this week, it doesn't seem to work anymore, but um, it used to work, it was pretty cool. I was walking in Oakland, California, uh, near the Grand Avenue Church one day, and I looked, and over in, the, over in the bush there, I saw this parking meter. Somebody had obviously broken it off and snapped it off and stolen the money or something like this, and the thing was just laying there, so I decided the city probably wouldn't want it back, so... I made, like, I made like a tourist, <laughs> and I've had this ever since. And uh, it's, it's actually, as I say, it used to be pretty cool. You could actually drop coins in there, and it would, it would do its thing. And I thought, okay, that's a very fitting graphic for not much time left. <clears throat> and right now, you wish it was running because it only has about 11 minutes on there. <laughs> yeah. Um, Obviously, knowing that uh, we were heading to this Sabbath, that this was our last Sabbath to be with you, uh, you, you know, you want to come up with something clever. You want to come up with something memorable and yet not hokum and all this kind of thing. And I honestly, I, I couldn't think of any great deep theology. I, I, part, of me, part of me thought, no, you just treat it like any other given Sabbath. You just give it your best on some great scripture concept and give it your best. And I thought, yeah, yes and no. And so I decided that I actually wanted to just reflect on something in the Bible that is actually amazing. Years and years and years ago, I, for a period of time, became quite fascinated with the stories of death in the Bible. I know that's really morbid, astoundingly morbid, but I found that the more I looked at the stories of deaths that are recorded in the Bible, the more it made sense of life. And it made sense of how to live. How you approach the day of your death is pretty much that which will be defined on the choices of life that you made to get there. And you see that in the Bible over and over again, that for the, most, the, the vast majority of people, pretty well what is recorded about the day of their death is pretty predictable. Pretty predictable. And so I thought, okay, back, back up from there. Go, you know, get for those who knew they were dying and they knew that they were given their last words, we actually have a series of those recorded in the Bible. And those, those are worth spending time with. Uh, the first actually that off the top of my head that I can remember, uh, Genesis 49, the patriarch Jacob has gathered his sons about him and he knows he's not getting any younger and he knows his time is short. And so he gathers his sons about to him and he, he gives out these predictive prophe prophecies about each of his sons. Now years ago in Adventism, Stephen Haskell, a resident of, the, of this community, uh, published this book, The Cross and Its Shadow. And the whole book is actually worth it. Even today, a hundred and... Uh, 20 years later, 118 years later, the book is still worth it today for the last 14 chapters. The last 14 chapters are really still worth having. I mean, not that the rest of it isn't, but it's still pretty interesting stuff. And what it is was Stephen Haskell actually went through and he, he looked at the prophecies of Jacob, his last words to each of his sons, Gad and Asher and Naphtali, etc. And he showed how literally those what he said to those sons actually did play out not only in the life of those sons, but in the history of those tribes. That the personality and the challenges and the, the, the concerns and the warnings that he gave in Genesis 49 as he was on his deathbed played out in the histories of these tribes. A pretty fascinating, fascinating little concept. And so then literally he comes to death at the beginning of Genesis 50. But he knew that, he knew that you know, whatever I'm going to say, I've got to say it today. And so he gathers his sons around him. Um, moving forward, you think of then Moses. Moses kind of does it, but Moses, ah, there's something wrong with Moses. His final words last about seven chapters. Um, but if you want to get the synopsis of it, you go to Deuteronomy 33. If you want to see what is it that Moses gives to his people, knowing that he's not going to be saying any more, because the Lord has already shared with him, you're going up on top of the hill and you're not coming back down. And the nation knows it. And so if you want to get the, just the, the Reader's Digest condensed version of what is important to Moses as he's right at the end, with his people. He, Deuteronomy 33, probably. 
Probably one of the best known in the Bible then, of course, comes from his prime minister, his right-hand man, Joshua. And if you want to turn in your Bibles to Joshua 24, it's the very famous passage. Joshua now knows he's, he's, his days are numbered, and he wants to leave a legacy. Which, by the way, as you remember, the Bible says this guy left a legacy. It says that the, el- that the nation of Israel was loyal to God and doing the things of God all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua. That anybody who had been under his influence, they couldn't shake him. His shadow was so dominant for God that they, they couldn't shake him. And all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, they kept the nation in line because of his influence, which is a a great statement. But of course, then you have those resounding two verses in Joshua 24. Verse 14. Now therefore fear the Lord. Serve him in sincerity and in truth. Put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of of the flood and in Egypt, back before the Jordan, back before the Red Sea. Serve the Lord. And if, if it isn't good enough for you, if, if, if this doesn't make sense, if it seemed evil to you to serve the Lord, then just come out and be honest about it. Uh, years ago, Jim Crabby, uh, Crabtree, Crabby we called him, uh, wonderful youth minister, wonderful guy, good friend. Um, Jim and Judy, when, when he got out of college, he decided he was going to be a youth minister, and he went to Sacramento Central, I think, or Carmichael Central. Uh, anyway, he went to uh, Sacramento Central Church, and he said, these kids are going to be my kids, and they're going to be my kids till I die. And he, he was never going to accept another call. And Crabby was at, at Sacramento Central Church as the youth pastor for something like 26 years. I mean, he had kids, and he had their kids' kids, and all this kind of stuff. And finally, ultimately, he went to pastor a, 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 an intergenerational church, finally, after many, many years. But that was his attitude about what he was going to make in the commitment to that, that church family. But Crabby told me one day, and he was one of our leading voices in youth ministry in North America, uh, only one Crabby. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. A great guy. I love him, but there's only one of him. Um, Crabby one day looked at me and says, I've come to the place where I've learned one thing in youth ministry. There's something that is, is absolutely the number one ultimate goal of youth ministry, and that is just get kids to be honest. Don't let them be hypocrites. Get them to be honest. Force them to honesty. J- Joshua just said that. Look, if, if, if this serving God thing really isn't that big a deal to you, come on, be honest about it. No hypocrisy. If it seemed evil to you this day to serve the Lord, then go ahead and choose. You know, I, I, don't play the game. Don't try to impress anybody. Go ahead and choose. Whether the gods that your fathers served, the gods of the Amorites and the lands where you're dwelling now, but I know for me, as for me and my house, we serve the Lord. You do what you're going to do and quit being a hypocrite about it. But I know where I'm going. Who's going with me? It's a, it's a wonderful passage. And that's Joshua's final words. In the very next chapter, uh, in, in Judges chapter 1, you have Caleb, uh, who is Joshua's right-hand man. I, I love Caleb. Caleb is one of my favorite characters in the Bible. I don't even know for sure. In fact, I kind of honestly do believe Caleb wasn't Israelite. There are clues and and things that he actually was not a Hebrew. He was an adoptee, that he was Kenizzite, and he was brought in, adopted into the tribes. And it may have been, and which he actually then was the leader of Judah. He was the spy of Judah. And he, he may have been the first citizen across the Jordan River. After the priests went through, because the tribe of Judah went first, and he may have led the tribe of Judah. And I really like that. I think that's so cool. Wouldn't that be something if we get to heaven and we find out that actually the first average layman citizen of the nation who went through the Jordan River wasn't even a Jew. It was an adoptee. Somebody God brought in. How cool would that be? And I really like Caleb. And Caleb, in every level, when you read the story, Caleb should have been the leader of the people. 
He had so much more grit and determination and, and he would take the whole nation on by himself. Joshua was, was much more hesitant and reticent. Uh, Joshua struggled with leadership and God chose Joshua. And, and you don't ever see Caleb whine about it. You don't see Caleb complain and say, oh, what's up with this God? I was a faithful spy. I stood up to the nation before Joshua did. And you didn't choose me? You don't ever see that, not once in his life. Except for one time he approaches Joshua and he says, okay, Joshua, th today I'm telling you the way it's going to be. I know you're the leader of the people, but I'm making my demands today. And it was a promise that God had made to him and he wasn't going to let anybody deprive him of it. Not even Joshua. I'm calling the shots today, Joshua. I love Caleb. Caleb's such a good guy. And you don't really get the final words of Caleb in Joshua chapter, uh, Judges chapter 1. What you get is his attitude. I'm too old to fight. We haven't yet completely conquered the land. And I'm not going to die until I know it's going to get done. And if I can't make it get done anywhere else in the nation, it's going to get done in my territory. And I've got this one village that I haven't yet been able to conquer in my territory, but I'm not going to die without this thing being settled. And so I will give my daughter and all of my inheritance to whoever has the courage to stand up and will take that one village because I can't, and I'm not dying until I see it. That's kind of his last words. That's, that's so great. You continue on. The last words of David, um, they were memorable to me in that when I was... 16 years old, uh, it was the first choir song I ever directed. Uh, I, I was allowed to direct the choir in Randall Thompson's The Last Words of David, and it, it started a path that ended up the next year they gave me my own choir, which was a kick. I had a traveling choir when I was a senior in high school, and then uh, when I was in college, I did choral stuff as part of my student teaching and all that. And so, but the first song I ever directed was Randall Thompson's The Last Words of David. He that ruleth over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. It's just, it's, it's a wonderful, you can go through, there are a few more, but I want to, I want to get to the New Testament. You certainly have in Acts chapter 7, the last words of Stephen. He's at the edge of the pit. He's 12 seconds from death. And his eyes are opened and he sees Christ. Man, when you're right 12 seconds from death, that's really the only thing you want to see. You want to see Jesus. I see him at the right hand of the Father. And those are his final words recorded. Certainly, the Apostle Paul, his final words are well known. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, I, it is now time for me to die. And I'm okay with that because I know that henceforth the Lord has laid up for me a crown of righteousness. And not just for me, but for everybody. This stuff's free. The whole party is for everybody. And everybody's invited. There is laid up a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give you. One of my favorite pieces of contemporary art right now is a picture of a saint kneeling before Jesus with a whole bunch of people behind him. And Jesus is putting the crown on this unworthy person. How cool is that? Jesus, the day when he will lay your crown on you. And he'll lean down and he'll whisper some inside joke to you, which will make sense to you and to nobody else, and you'll never forget it, what he whispers to you in that moment. Jesus, you can take two times, one on the cross, Luke 23, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. But then his final, final words, Acts chapter 1, Matthew 28, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Goodbye. The final words of Jesus, the thing that he, he never wanted us to forget, I am with you always. But this morning I'd like to have you focus on what was read for the scripture. It's Peter. It's actually not from 2 Peter, it's from 1 Peter. But the reason that you can say this is okay to be kind of Peter's last words because Peter didn't know if he was going to live long enough to write 2 Peter. 
35 years before, by the side of the lake, one morning, Jesus had told him, Peter, down the line, the day will come when you're going to be crucified. I'm just telling you. And Peter lived three and a half decades with that awareness that ultimately the day would come when he was going to follow Jesus in crucifixion. John chapter 21. And now the pressure is rising. And in 1 Peter, he's writing. And he doesn't know that he's going to live long enough to write 2 Peter. And when he writes 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8, this is so important, and this is kind of what I wanted to leave with you. Above all things. Above all things. When you say above all things, that means everything else comes behind this one. Everything else comes behind this one. Nothing else I've ever written should go above this. Nothing else I've ever said should go above this. Above all all things. Be nice to each other. Above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves. Because charity is going to cover a whole lot of nonsense. A lot of the old grudges and a lot of the old frustrations and a lot of the old times when maybe you didn't get along and a lot of the times when maybe somebody in the church did something you kind of wish they hadn't or they weren't as thoughtful as they should have been or they didn't care the way they should have or they said something that was unkind or maybe they didn't fulfill a promise that they said they were going to. So what? Above all things, be nice to each other. Love one another. Love one another above all things. So that's kind of that's kind of what I wanted to say today. Whatever happens in the history of this church family, love one another. It's not my words. They came from somewhere else. Our closing hymn is hymn number 227.
week as I was getting ready, uh, thinking about this in like a sentence for the bulletin cover and this kind of thing, I actually read the final words of uh, probably 150 people, uh, you know, famous people, uh, Benjamin Franklin and, and, you know, things like this. Uh, what were their final words that were recorded? Just to see, you know, what people have said at last moments. And um, I, I realized that my favorite, my favorite of all, which is really what I want to leave you with you beyond what Peter said, you know, that just be nice to each other. Love each other and that will do away with a lot of the stupidity. It'll do away with a lot of the nonsense. Just love one another. And um, uh, I realize my favorite is something I've shared with you before. It's from Robert Bolt's play and the movie uh, Man for All Seasons. Thomas More is standing uh, moments away from his execution. He's going to be beheaded. And as he stands there on the scaffold as they're going to behead him, he looks at the executioner and he says to him, he says, do thy diligence and do thy job quickly. And uh, do, not, you know, do not regret what you must do in your duty. Do thy job quickly. And uh, he then said, you but hasten me to God. And uh, don't worry about the theology, okay? You but hasten me to God. And at that point, the Lord Inquisitor, the chief prosecutor, steps up to him and he says, Sir Thomas, you are so very certain of this? And Thomas's answer I hope you take it to heart. Thomas's answer is, he would not reject one who is blithe, so very blithe, to meet him. If you have any iff iffiness about your relationship with Christ or God, if you wish it, if you want it, there is no way he's going to push you away. There is no way you want him, there's no way he will not receive you. That's this God. Amen. Don't ever forget it. Amen. We are just going to have a prayer of dedication for Pastor Pate and for Sandy as they go on to their new position. And we ask the elders to come up here and if you guys can reach a shoulder or... I'm going to pray first, and then whoever is willing or wanting to pray can as well. Heavenly Father, thank you so much, first of all, for Pastor Pate and Sandy. Thank you for their ministry here, for their turn in our lives. Thank you for what they have given and what they have sacrificed and for the blessing and the love that they have brought to us, for the education and the knowledge and just the passion. And Lord, we just want to dedicate them to you now as they move on. We want to pray for Don's ministry, his ministry on a, a public campus and in a church that will be blessed by him. We want to pray that you will open the hearts and work on the hearts even now of people that he will touch. We want to pray for Sandy and correct placement, fulfilling placement and work that will help her to be fulfilled and to use her talents for you. And we want to pray for their family, Lord. It's wonderful that they're going to be a little bit closer and I pray that you will bless their grandkids and bless their kids with their presence and uh, give them many happy days with their family. And Lord, I just pray a, a blessing on, on their placement wherever they land as far as home is concerned. May they find a place that is refuge and safe and beautiful. Thank you, Father, for them. Thank you for what they have been to us. We love you. Amen. <laughs>